Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So what is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders? Well basically, it is the manual that the American Psychiatric Association publishes that includes all recognized mental disorders. At this point in time, the DSM-5 has roughly 265 disorders contained within it. And in the rest of this course, we're going to be learning about a lot of them. The first DSM was published in 1952 by the American Psychiatric Association. It was a small little manual and really didn't ripple through the field in any influential way. The DSM-2, which was published in 1968, wasn't a whole lot more influential. And it was, again, bigger than the DSM-1, but still a relatively small and uninfluential manual. It was with the publication of the DSM-3 by the American Psychiatric Association in 1980 that everything changed. This manual, right here, the DSM-3, was a game changer in psychiatry. The DSM went from being really something that most clinicians didn't pay much attention to, to being what we now refer to as the Diagnostic Bible of Psychiatry. Why was the DSM-3 so influential? Well, it had a number of innovations in it that we still see in our current DSMs today. It introduced diagnostic criteria, the sets of behavioral symptoms that clinicians use so that they can all judge whether somebody has a disorder using the same basic criteria. That was a big deal in the DSM-3, and it allowed the DSM to try to improve its diagnostic reliability. If all the clinicians are using the same criteria to determine whether somebody has a disorder, then we would hope that the diagnostic reliability, the degree to which the clinicians end up at the same diagnosis, will increase. The DSM-5 is the latest of a long line of DSMs, and of course, if you think you're a smarty pants, you would probably guess that there have been five DSMs, but that would not be true. Yeah, they've tricked you. There have been seven DSMs. There was DSM-1 in 1952, the original classic DSM that got it all started. DSM-2, which appeared in 1968. DSM-3, which, as we mentioned, was kind of the game changer, the one that really made the DSM the, the diagnostic bible and made the DSM really influential around the world. But that was in 1980 they published the DSM-3. They very quickly decided to revise it, and they published in 1987 the DSM-3R. It was so different in many respects that some people thought it should have been called DSM-4, but nonetheless, they called it DSM-3R. That was in 1987. By 1994, they were off and running with the DSM-4. And that one was revised slightly. They did a tweak of it, kind of a revision of it, in 2000, the DSM-4TR. The fonts and stuff are prettier in this one. The cover's a nicer color. And they changed a few of the minor things in it. The, the, the criteria for disorders stayed the same. But one of the things that they changed was some of the text about the disorders and some of the diagnostic coding got changed as well. And so this brings us to the current version of the manual, the DSM-5, which was published in 2013 after a long development process that was riddled with controversy. The DSM-5 defines mental disorders as syndromes characterized by clinically significant disturbances in an individual's cognition, emotion regulation, or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. So according to this definition, mental disorders are internal dysfunctions that people have. What are some of the advantages of the DSM? First of all, it provides a common language for communication among professionals. One of its goals is to facilitate easy and quick communication. A DSM diagnosis potentially does this by allowing a lot of information to be conveyed in a single diagnostic term. Two, the DSM is important in getting people treatment. Its medical model approach says that accurate diagnosis is essential in making sure that we treat people the correct way. A DSM diagnosis is usually a practical necessity, actually, because in the U.S., at least, insurance companies won't usually pay for treatment without one. Three, DSM helps advance scientific understanding of mental disorders. Let's take an example. Having shared DSM criteria for schizophrenia, provides a way for researchers to diagnose and study the causes of schizophrenia, as well as effective treatments for it. And so a lot of people say that despite the DSM's flaws, it really has improved our understanding and treatment of mental disorders. And fourth, the DSM gives patients names for their problems and lessens the stigma of mental disorder. 
supporters of DSM argue that diagnoses bring mental illness out of the shadows. What about the DSM's disadvantages? Critics raise a number of concerns about it. First of all, they note that DSM has reliability and validity problems. Critics point to high levels of comorbidity, in which a client qualifies for multiple diagnoses. And according to critics, if a client fits a lot of different DSM categories, then the DSM may not be reliably or validly identifying distinct disorders. Two, the DSM medicalizes everyday problems. Even though the DSM supporters say that diagnosis reduces stigma, its critics often say that diagnosis is actually dehumanizing. And these critics worry that the DSM incorrectly recasts everyday human struggles as diseases. For example, critics view disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, a childhood diagnosis characterized by severe recurrent temper outbursts, as improperly turning an everyday problem, namely children having temper tantrums, into a medical disorder. Other diagnoses, such as ADHD, generalized anxiety disorder, and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, have all been criticized for medicalizing everyday problems by classifying them as mental disorders. Now that you've had a chance to learn a little bit about it, what do you think of the DSM-5?